Stephen Foster is the trunk of the tree of American music. This is really, really fine music, and it's been part of the American musical landscape for 150 years or more by now. He was the first person in America who really tried to support himself as a songwriter. Nobody had ever done that before. He invented the occupation. He showed the way. Foster was an extraordinary talent with an extraordinary ear. He's one of those remarkable popular musicians who could hear almost any genre of music and hear the possibilities of that music for pop songwriting. It's hard to get more American than being born on Independence Day. And that's exactly what Stephen Foster did in 1826. Well, I suppose Eliza, his mother, was quite a bit more involved in that endeavor. The Fosters were a family who lived by boom and bust, and it was more of the latter that defined Stephen's childhood. His father, William, was big into turnpikes and canals, and even served two terms in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives. But his finances were equal parts mishandled and the victim of misfortune. At one point, in full patriotic fervor, William paid a small fortune to ship supplies south to Andrew Jackson to help the then general win the Battle of New Orleans, only he was left footing $2,700 of the bill when the U.S. government did not fully reimburse him. The post-war economy turned into a depression, and men like William Foster believed that the policies of the Bank of the United States either caused the depression or at best, didn't make things better when the Depression started. Waves of hardship were widespread and politically motivating. And it catapulted war hero and anti-central bank candidate Andrew Jackson to two terms in the White House, forming the backbone of the antebellum Democratic Party. The Fosters would remain loyal to the Democrats from then on. The Fosters lived by a lot of patronage in politics that uh, the, uh, the Stephen's father had become mayor of Allegheny and they would Get, and he got a job for the brother with the treasury in Washington, D.C., with head for Henry Foster. And he, he got that job only when there was a Democrat in power in the office. That's how everything was done. Stephen was the youngest of the Foster children to survive infancy, so he really didn't have any memory of a time when the family wasn't terminally going broke. There's very little of the antebellum Steel City and his mature music. It's less of a nostalgia for what once was and more of a idealized nostalgia for what he wanted to have had existed. Now we don't know a great deal about Foster's life or his habits or his temperament. What sources do exist are often first-hand accounts and they can disagree on the details. So we don't know, for instance, how much he liked the outdoors, but you know, he probably wasn't the best student. He wasn't an extrovert and he loved music. Even if we don't have detailed historiography of every year of Foster's life, what we can do in a kind of historical ethnomusicology kind of way is to reconstruct the context in which he operated. He was about seven when his mother took him to Smith & Miller's music store in downtown Pittsburgh. And according to family accounts, he picked up the flagellate, a popular 19th century woodwind, and he played Hill Columbia perfectly on the spot. There's probably a lot of embellishment in this account, but Stephen hadn't figured out melodies on the guitar when he was two, so there's no putting it past him. And as he grew older, he played the piano and the flute. Down upon the river. Music in the early U.S. didn't have much going for it yet. The nation's leading orchestras had yet to materialize. You had a piano in your home if you could afford it. The Industrial Revolution was pricing more people into the market, and instruments still had the cachet of being a rich person item. But there wasn't much of a market for popular music as we know it. And some of this was due to copyright law. As broken as the system is today, it was even worse back in the early 19th century. What copyright existed was a tangled and ineffective web of regulations that either wouldn't or couldn't be enforced across national borders. As the Industrial Revolution completed its overhaul of society, the U.S. extended protection to musical compositions in 1831. American composers, though, still had to compete against pirated international publications because 
something getting published in Europe didn't protect it from being republished in the United States. This was a form of piracy via legal loophole. Miserly publishers didn't have to pay a cent to their authors. This was especially problematic for American composers of instrumental music. For songwriters, as Foster was, the only real competition in this regard would have to come from England due to the shared language. But even then, English and American cultures were and continue to be quite different. His big problem was domestic piracy, one publisher poaching something from another. Popular music in the form of folk music did exist, but it was limited by its cultural and political environment. Pianos were primarily played by young unmarried women, including the girls in the Foster family, who were trained for a time by the English immigrant William Cumming Peters, who crops up quite a bit in the Foster story. Stephen was precocious, but it went against the Protestant work ethic to give boys the kind of music lessons that the girls got, even if the Fosters could have afforded them. It remained his only true passion and his greatest hobby, but he needed something more to push him into trying to make a career of it. I'm standing on the site or they're walking on the site of the former Athens Academy in Athens, Pennsylvania, just about a mile, if that, from the New York border. Stephen Foster attended the Athens Academy in 1840 and 1841, and it was as part of their graduation ceremonies, the April Exhibition in April 1841, that his first piece, the Tioga Waltz, received its world premiere. This was for either three or four flutes. Sources differ as to the number. We only know what the melody sounded like ish because his brother Morrison remembered the tune some 30 years later and it was transcribed from that. Morrison, who's not the most reliable source of information on his brother, also tells us that this piece was wildly received. People just loved it. And I don't doubt that because it takes a lot of guts for a kid of his age to go up there and perform his own piece on stage with some of his friends. However, Morrison wasn't even there at the time. It was premiered at the site of the Athens Presbyterian Church. It burned down 20 years after the premiere. They rebuilt it on the same spot, and the Athens Presbyterian Church continued to worship there until the early 2010s, when, due to declining membership, they formed a united congregation with several other local Presbyterian churches, and they still worship just up the road in Waverly, New York. The Tioga Waltz was dedicated to a lady named Frances Wells. She was a school friend of Stephen Foster's and a wealthy young lady. Well, her family was wealthy at least. She decided that she was going to skip the graduation ceremony because she wanted to move up her wedding date, which is perfectly understandable until you realize that she was supposed to recite something in Greek at the ceremony. So there's pretty good evidence to suggest that it was Frances who asked Stephen to write and play this piece, to A, cover up for her social faux pas, and B, so that she could have a nice piece at her wedding just a few days later, where the Tioga Waltz received a second performance. Now, Stephen's schooling was as haphazard as it was nonchalant. For instance, he attended Jefferson College in Cannonsburg, Pennsylvania for, I don't know, maybe about a week before he dropped out. It wasn't like he was unschooled, he just wasn't formally schooled. All that wrapped up by the time he was about 15. He received some private instruction in things like German and French and mathematics and even in watercolor painting. I soon will be in New Orleans and then I'll look all around. And when I find Susanna, I'll fall upon the ground. The emergence of Stephen Foster as the first American songwriter is, like it or not, intimately tied to the ugly tradition of blackface minstrelsy. There is a lot to unpack here, and it goes deeper than just the surface-level racism. While Pennsylvania had gradually abolished slavery starting in 1780, servitude was still very common, and racial resentment even more so. The Fosters could not afford a servant, but family friend Sarah Collins, whose son was the namesake of Stephen Collins Foster, gifted them three years of work from a young black woman named Kitty, starting in 1834. The next year, Stephen Foster found a voice as a mimic of some of the most popular minstrel acts, then touring. The roots of minstrelsy lie in complicated, intertwined areas. Minstrelsy is an outgrowth of a street, a combination of street performance idioms that kind of come together in festive situations, 
and in working class situations, especially uh, on in harbors and on rivers. Uh, so some of the earliest roots of minstrelsy lie in northern festivals like Pinkster, which is an Afro-Dutch uh, harvest festival. It goes outwards along the rivers uh, with traveling troops of comic actors. One of the parts of their repertoire was expected to be these comic characters, ethnic stereotypes of all types. It combines Anglo-Celtic dance ideas, lots and lots of African-American influence, particularly Afro-Caribbean influence. Minstrelsy was a complicated phenomenon. It trafficked in ugly, slur-filled stereotypes of Black Americans' culture and accent. They blacked up their faces and did grotesque dances and sort of uh, parodies of uh, Black people. White Americans appropriated the mannerisms and exaggerated the appearances of an oppressed class to, ironically, both free themselves from social mores and to perpetuate the stereotypes that reinforced white supremacy. These people had fun pretending they were Black for a number of reasons. Uh, number one, it was always because many of them were either poor, uh, often of Irish descent, um, and uh, it was always good to have somebody to look down upon and to make fun of. But secondly, minstrelsy also ex gave people a certain kind of freedom to act behind a mask. You know, if you were a uh, decorous uh, white person, you had to behave. But if you had a black mask, you could uh, go out and have yourself a high time. And it's ironic because in many ways, white people, and to this day, envy a certain freedom that they think that blacks have, not realizing that that freedom is the result of their not having the bourgeois options. It was marketed as an imitation of the ways of Southern Negroes double scare quotes. It was not. That said, there are certain instruments that become iconic of minstrelsy, most notably the five-string banjo, which are absolutely core, not necessarily to deep South Black identity, but absolutely core to Afro-Caribbean identity. What we sometimes forget is that those people traveled not only throughout the salt water of the Caribbean, but they traveled upstream into the freshwater of the Mississippi River Valley and the Ohio River Valley. There is a meeting on the western slope of the Appalachians between European settlers who primarily play the fiddle for dance music and Afro-Caribbean river workers and people who came in contact with those Afro-Caribbean river workers who played the thing called the banjo or the banzo or the strum strum. River towns and port cities are absolutely at the heart of where most American vernacular musics begin. That's where musics traveling with people meet. The term Jim Crow originated as a minstrel character portrayed by Thomas Rice. Thomas Dartmouth Rice and performers of the 1820s and early 1830s, they set up this solo character. It's mostly a characteristic song, like Thomas Dartmouth Rice singing 57 choruses of Jump Jim Crow on the stage of the Bowery Theater, you know, these crazy pop phenomena. Within a decade of Rice debuting the character, minstrelsy had boomed in popularity with working class crowds around the country. According to the Rice family, Thomas Rice met Stephen Foster in 1845, the same year that Foster first tried writing minstrel music. Foster's friend group fashioned themselves the Knights of the Square Table, and they gathered at each other's houses to sing what they called Negro melodies. Foster wrote his first song in the genre, Louisiana Bell, for this group. Louisiana is that good old state where Marcel used to dwell. He used to own a pretty yellow gal. She was the Louisiana Belle. Oh, Belle, don't you tell. Don't tell Marcel that I love you well. Oh, Belle, don't you tell. I was going to marry you, Louisiana Belle. So how much of minstrel music was appropriation of black music then? That's a tougher nut to crack, and it largely depends on the era. Over its existence, minstrelsy evolved to fit the dominant culture. That line of questioning also assumes that black and white American music evolved independently, only for the latter to appropriate the former. Truth is, the historical record is much murkier. The songs Foster sang and started writing were stereotypes of black music as much as black people. They were white ideas of what black music was, without any care for attribution or accuracy. By the early 1840s, these songs had solidified into evening-length performances known as minstrel shows. The dominant form of American entertainment, or 
the next couple of decades. It continues to be this, this idiom and it's this sort of dark thread that continues just beneath the surface of an awful lot of American entertainments. Everything from Laurel and Hardy to Mickey Mouse is based upon a foundation of blackface minstrelsy and its racist caricature. The question of why minstrelsy got as popular as it did so quickly has to do with more than just white supremacy. In the decades leading up to the Civil War, minstrelsy was popular pretty much everywhere, but especially so in the North, and especially in the rapidly urbanizing, industrializing Ohio River Valley, of which Pittsburgh is a part. Suddenly, you had young people who were leaving the farm and going to the big cities or the medium-sized cities. You actually had a youth market in the, so much the same way that the teenagers who were part of the ba baby boom created a market for rock and roll in the uh, 1950s and 60s. The various immigrant populations from across Eastern Europe had to come together over racism as a kind of weird unifying force. They also kind of sympathized with the way that black people were depicted. They didn't have any experience with being in the South. They certainly didn't understand chattel slavery from a first-hand perspective. But they did understand what it was like to be treated as a cog and an industrial machine. How people who were in charge of things didn't really care about you at all. The people who watched those um, shows, of, of the minstrel shows, they had never been to the South. But in their minds, the South did not have the industry it didn't, so it was like pristine. Minstrelsy's popularity was a bellwether for race relations, which was tied into the economy, especially in western Pennsylvania. During downturns, the white working class facing unemployment and destitution turned on free black citizens, thinking that they would take their jobs. In 1838, Pennsylvanians disenfranchised these free black citizens, revoking a right to vote that they had previously held. Foster grew up with all of this. With the rise of minstrelsy, he was pulled between it and the genteel saccharine parlor music that was little more than watered-down European romanticism. If he leaned fully into minstrelsy, to really make a career of it, he would have had to perform, which he hated doing. Minstrel performers were far better known than composers, and that kind of pressure to perform didn't exist in parlor music. That was primarily the repertoire for young female pianists, so it's a little wonder that his first published piece, Open Thy Lattice, Love, is in that tradition. Like a lot of Foster's life, the details are sketchy. In this case, we don't know how Foster got this piece published in Philadelphia in December 1844. Foster family lore holds that Stephen encountered the British composer baritone Henry Russell, who toured the United States singing his own sentimental and dramatic ballads. Foster's earliest songs used poetry from the exact same poets that Russell himself said and sang. It's extremely different to his minstrel music. And throughout much of his career, especially in these early years, there'd be this duality minstrelsy and parlor music. They couldn't be more different. In terms of total percentage of his output, though, Foster was just a dabbler in minstrel music. As a composer, he's so much broader than um, the minstrel songs and the plantation songs. Um, he, he wrote only about 12, I think. But these songs still outshine the rest of his work that we still know them today. On September 11th, 1847, American popular music as we know it was born with the premiere of O oh, Susanna, a melody so deeply rooted in the collective American consciousness that many people assume that it's a genuine, bona fide American folk song. I came from Alabama with a banjo on my knee. I'm going to Louisiana, my true love for to see. It rained all night the day I left, the weather it was dry. The sun's so hot I froze to death, Susanna, don't you cry. 
Oh, Susanna, oh, don't you cry for me. I come from Alabama with the banjo on my knee. It swept the country so quickly and so thoroughly that a version of it was basically the theme song to the California Gold Rush. Well, I'm going to Sacramento with my washboard on my knee. Da -da -do 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 -da -do 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 do 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 Hey! Of course, most of us either don't know the verses, or we know them only in broad strokes. So it's not just the catchiness of the tune. The verses themselves speak to the racism of the time, but also the dangers of technological progress. And we can interpret this song in a number of different ways. The most intriguing to me is that, in part, it's a memorial for his late sister, musically gifted and adventurous Charlotte Susanna Foster, who died in Louisville, Kentucky on October 20th, 1829. It had rained hard in Louisville, but was so dry in Pittsburgh that boats were having trouble navigating. At the same time, the earliest minstrel songs, the kind that Foster would have sung in shows as a preteen, were also marked by a stream of contradictory nonsense. Stephen Foster's songwriting career really began almost a year earlier, in October 1846, when his song There's a Good Time Coming made it to William Cumming Peters in Cincinnati. By that same year, Foster himself had moved to Cincinnati, a much larger and more economically diverse city than Pittsburgh, to work for his brother Dunning, who had set up shop with his friend Archibald Irwin, a second-generation commission merchant whose business relied on selling local products down the river. Stephen was like the junior guy, 18, 19 years old, working in the shop and probably uh, copying rosters of uh, receipts and that kind of thing. He worked inside the office, and also he worked outside on the wharves, and he saw the cotton being loaded and unloaded. Pittsburgh and Cincinnati both dealt extensively with cotton from southern plantations up through the Civil War. But there are a lot of differences between those cities. Cincinnati was an incredibly multicultural place. It had a number of different urban uh, immigrant communities, a German immigrant community, an Irish immigrant community, mostly working class, mostly living on the waterfront within walking distance of their work on the waterfront. And it also had, for its size, the largest percentage of free blacks of any city in the Union in the 1840s. Now, it wasn't a very large population, but for the size of that population, an unusually large percentage of that population was free African American. Cincinnati was on the watery margin that separated slave state from free state. It was the closest that Foster would be to the South for any extended period of time. He only really went South-South once in his life that we can confirm, and this was in February 1852, on a steamboat captained by Dunning. So how much did Foster's views on race change by his exposure to this environment? If Indeed, they changed it all. No direct evidence exists that would reveal his position, but his music did change and mature over time. Not in Cincinnati, but over the course of his entire life. He was able to think more freely about the slave situation. The sympathy we see in lyrics to Nellie Was a Lady show a sensitivity rarely encountered in minstrelsy. It's about a widower who's crying and grieving because her wife at that time slaves could not marry legally. And he calls her a lady. Was it even minstrel music at all? Is it fair to call it that, to lump it in with all those other pieces? Some would say no. Despite earlier publication, Foster didn't think it was possible to make a career just out of music. So many of these early scores circulated among his friends or were given out free of charge to minstrel groups, a habit that would cost him dearly throughout the rest of his life, beginning in Cincinnati. William Cumming Peters would publish Foster's songs throughout the late 1840s, from his base on the corner of 4th and Walnut Streets in downtown Cincinnati. Peters paid Foster $100 for Oh Susanna, conning the naive songwriter out of hundreds, if not thousands, more in royalties. Peters neither paid Foster in accordance with his talents or his popularity, nor did he help him gain fame. Peters worked with Foster to avoid having his name on his minstrel music. People in the industry widely believed not without merit, that having a performer's name on the cover of a minstrel hit was more enticing than the composer, who was often a complete unknown. Throughout his life, Foster would make poor business decisions like these. Had he made different choices, things might not have ended so tragically. <laughs> Thank you.
parlor music designed for young women to play was a more seemly, if less lucrative, genre. It was status to be able to play the piano, that the family could afford a piano, and afford piano lessons, and only middle class, or upper, upper classes girls could afford that. It wasn't Foster's wheelhouse in his time, but it's attracted much more attention as a part of his legacy. Because a lot of singers, understandably, do not want to touch the minstrel music with a 10-foot pole. In one other case, it was due to a dispute between radio broadcasters and the performing rights organization ASCAP in 1941, which drastically increased the fame of Foster's 1854 parlor song, Genie with a Light Brown Hair. Jane McDowell, the bold daughter of a liberal physician. Her father died suddenly, so she went back to Pittsburgh and he followed her back. Both Foster and Richard Cowan, former Knight of the Square Table, courted Jane at the same time, and one evening they showed up at the same time. <laughs> it was a mix-up in the schedules. Whereupon the small, reserved, and not conventionally attractive Foster plopped himself in a chair and read the whole evening. He was a very recessive person in sort of much of his personality. He was very shy. And then he proposed to Jane as soon as Cowan left. Jane accepted, but this weird and hasty proposal led to an equally weird and hasty wedding in July 1850, and the marriage was far from idyllic. The shock of moving in with her husband's overcrowded extended family, whose politics were not shared with her own family, trying to raise their newborn daughter Marion after William Foster suffered the stroke that would lead to his terminal decline, it was all just too much. The Foster family and the McDowell family were, were very different. It is curious because Jane was not particularly musical and was not interested in music. It's also curious and sort of creepy that they had one child who was born almost the day nine months after they got married. We have little to go on as usual, but it's safe to assume that these two were so fundamentally different as to be incompatible. From Jane's point of view, his income was very unstable. They were sort of nomadic, up and down. Secondly, he was an alcoholic. Did he drink because he had an unhappy marriage? Or was his marriage unhappy because he drank? They'd rarely lived together for any extended period of time again. Foster was the kind of guy who dovetailed his honeymoon with a business trip. Peters moved his operations to Baltimore in 1849, and Foster threw in his lot with firms that had previously made money pirating his work. So in fairness, most of them did this. When Foster first signed with Firth and Pond, their payments were in the form of 50 copies of each song, copyright notice included, so Foster could do with them whatever he pleased. This copyright notice should have prevented his habit of giving manuscripts out and getting pirated that way, but old habits died hard. One minstrel performer, a guy named Charles White, got his hands on Foster's Nellie Was a Lady and had the gumption to try to sell it to Firth and Pond as though he had written it. In short, Firth and Pond knew that Foster's links to the minstrel performing world could make them a whole lot of money, but Foster could muck it up for everybody by having him or one of his brothers give a copy to some minstrel group, especially if they didn't have that copyright notice. So, Firth and Pond cut him a deal for an 8% royalty, a luxury beyond luxury in an era when royalties were not a given at all. They reminded Foster not to flood the market, chasing fads or diluting his work's quality by writing too much. But against their warnings not to burn himself out, Foster turned out 32 songs in 1850 and 1851 as he tried to make a go of it as a professional songwriter. 
These included I Would Not Die in Springtime, published under a pseudonym, followed by I Would Not Die in Summertime, under his own name as his supposed response. This man was making musical sock puppets. Minstrelsy would evolve over time to fit the changing landscape of American race relations. It also changed for Foster himself. By the time Foster stopped writing minstrel music, he had taken the genre from its ugly beginnings to one that acknowledged the humanity of the enslaved. The twin threads of minstrelsy and parlor music grew closer and closer until his masterpieces were the genres fused into works of lasting significance that transcended both of their labels. Most early minstrel music was really quite crude. He gave it much more sophistication uh, musically and also, I would say, thematically uh, in terms of real sympathy as opposed to simply uh, uh, parody and, and satire. And that's why it began to be called plantation music, which is a, a plantation songs, uh, elevating it somewhat. And the plantation song in the process upgraded the um, minstrel songs. To bring these songs into the parlor um, about the South, and you couldn't have the images of men in blackface, the performers on the cover. They took off the images of the African-Americans, which were insulting images, of course, from the minstrel songs are very, very horrible. There's none of the degradation uh, and insulting things about black people that you find in the later minstrel songs. There wasn't any making fun of these people in, in the songs. The homegrown music that paid was minstrelsy. When Foster tallied up his revenue, the spirit of my song earned him $5. The minstrel tune Nellie Bly earned him $564.37. Minstrel music paid orders of magnitude better, and yet Foster diversified his output. Like many whys in this story, there are all sorts of competing factors. Several are likely true to different extents. Think of all the major rock stars who tried to write Broadway musicals because they were tired of writing music for kids. They felt they had to be more grown up. They had to be more respectable. Minstrel music was greasy kid stuff. I think Foster, like blackface itself, and in fact, more broadly, like the popular song industry itself, is trying to shed working class and disreputable associations every way that they can. They're, tr they're trying, they are, I mean, I think it is a, I think it's, it is a, a straight up example of seeking a more upwardly mobile market. You write for the market and you target the market that's most lucrative. Foster's past agreements were coming back to haunt him. Foster did not perform his own music. The sheet music was sold under the name of the performing troops and their leaders, as though they had composed those songs. And the man who would do more to siphon credit from Stephen Foster than anybody else was Edwin Pierce Christie, who began his minstrel troupe, Christie's Minstrels, in Buffalo, New York, in 1843. He's an archetype of a kind of American entrepreneur. There's no evidence the two men ever met, not even any evidence that Foster ever saw Christie's Minstrels perform. It's probable that he saw them perform, but there's no, ev there's no hard evidence. And Christie is an example of somebody who kind of figures out there's a way to, to market this. Really, there's a way to clean this up. Christie realized that you could make it bigger. You could guarantee, literally guarantee on your posters that will give no offense to women and children. And you could start to repackage this idiom in these ways and sell it to the middle class. Christie was a mediocre musician at best, um, but he did apparently have a, a lovely singing voice. Uh, the lovely, he could do sweet harmonies. When Christie performed the songs, he did not wear the offensive black type of makeup that was worn by Al Jolson in the tw early 20th century. Christie paid for the rights to have himself credited as the composer of what Foster called his Ethiopian songs. Foster got more sales, Christie got exclusive rights to new Foster songs for a set number of weeks, and he used the cover pages as advertisement to boot. Christie got the better end of the bargain. It hurt Foster's cultural capital in the long term. Whatever Christie paid was a drop in the bucket compared to the fame of old folks at home. Way down upon the Swanee River, far, far away. There's 
One can't help but wonder if Foster's career may have gone differently if people had known its true authorship from the very beginning. Stephen Foster never set eyes on the Suwannee River, but he knew something about loss, of wandering around for a sense of home. A lot of people did. It was popular across the color line, the North and in the South. Foster finally achieved the synthesis of parlor and minstrel music he'd long been searching for, and he couldn't reap the full benefit. Old Folks at Home was so different, so popular, had such crossover appeal, the Foster soon realized his gaffe and tried to convince Christie to nullify their arrangement. I find I cannot write at all, he wrote Christie, unless I write for the public approbation and get credit for what I write. Christie, a far shrewder businessman, had no legal reason to give up the rights to Old Folks at Home or any other cash cow. If Christie had heartstrings, Foster's letter did not sufficiently tug at them. And of course, Christie said he was a wrote you know, he was a vacillating skunk and a plagiarist. He was not going to give that up, so he kept his name was on it until copyright uh, lapsed. Minstrelsy had become more mainstream in no small part because Foster, in his words, did a great deal to build up a taste for such music by removing the trashy and really offensive words, his words, that had theretofore characterized the genre. And Christie's troupe was kind of the perfect ensemble for these songs. They engaged in the very humanity and sentimentality that define Foster's best work, a habit that made them so unpopular in the South that they were chased out of Charleston, South Carolina for fear of their lives. Today, we have the privilege of looking back on these songs and seeing the ways in which they trafficked in the racism of their time. They're not perfect by any means, but for those who had known what minstrelsy had been, when they compared it to what it grew to be under Foster and Christie, well, it's just about as progressive as it could be while still being as popular as it was. Foster songs represented black Americans as full people, with thoughts and dreams and emotions. It's hard to believe that the writer of Oh Susanna's Callous Racism could have also written something like this. It would take a few more years for the N-word to finally disappear from Foster's songs entirely. But Foster went further than just these examples. In the original draft of My Old Kentucky Home, he included references to the freshly published anti-slavery novel Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was heavily adapted for the theatrical circuit and often interpolated Foster's songs when it was produced for the stage. In the end, he didn't want it published that way because there were a lot of Uncle Tom songs coming out on the, all the presses, and he wanted something you know different and original. The reference not making it into the final song assured it a greater degree of staying power, as a result, it's Kentucky's state song, at the expense of obscuring something that could better clarify Foster's stance on slavery, a controversy that we'll get to soon enough. Oh, the sun shines bright in the old Kentucky home To summer the darkies are gay The corn tops ripe and the meadows in the bloom While the birds make music all the day The young folks roll On the little cabin floor All merry, all happy and bright 
By and by, hard times comes a knocking out the door. Then my old Kentucky home, good night. In January 1853, Foster broke with Christie publicly. The pages of a New York City music journal credited Foster, not Christie, as the composer of Old Folks at Home, Nellie Bly, and other such hits. Even if Foster himself wasn't a household name, his music sure was. So what was it about Foster's music that embedded it so deep in the national psyche? In a word, melody. The concept, the idea that any genre of music can provide an idiom which can yield a popular song. That's what begins with Stephen Foster, more than anything else. What's remarkable about Foster's songs, and particularly about his melodies and the ubiquity of their uses, you hear them one or two times, especially those choruses, and you remember them. And because you're carrying them in the memory, they are infinitely portable. American music is somewhat distinct from uh, most European national traditions because it is like America, a mixture. America is a, as from the very beginning, a very diverse country. Stephen Foster was the first American composer to put together all the different threads of Irish music, of German leader, of, and we haven't even talked about uh, bel canto opera. The harmonies are not designed to be interesting or difficult to play. Popularity means getting in people's heads writing stuff that's memorable, inherently singable, or at least hummable. Folk music is naturally like this. So to write in a folk idiom, to appropriate an emergent musical grammar, to emulate that style of music means internalizing, consciously or unconsciously, elements like a tendency for certain melodic shapes and patterns to exist in the music, including like an ascending octave near the outset of songs, pulled from the Scotch-Irish tradition. People talk about the way that uh, Dvorak, when he came to America in the New World Symphony, brought in Native American and African American music. Well, Foster was there long before Dvorak, you know, celebrating and, and, and realizing the diversity In the early 1850s, as Foster was exploring and refining the idiom of sentimental minstrelsy, he was close friends with Charles Shiraz, who was an active abolitionist at the same time. And according to Shiraz family lore, was responsible for the words to some of Foster's most enduring songs, including Old Folks at Home. Charles Shiraz had a literary journal and he also had an anti-slavery journal a publication called the Albatross. And um, Stephen Foster, according to Charles Ross's mother, went there every, used to go there every day and sit with him and um, write his songs at her house, the songs that were the plantation songs. If you read and look at these songs very carefully, they were clearly anti-slavery. And the one in particular, Oh Boys Carry Me Long, was about a slave that the owner is taking down to bury, and he's not dead yet. He's just going to leave him in this gully and take the shirt off him that he was wearing and leave him on a board there to die. This was a, an, a poem that would have been published in uh, the, the national era. Any of the um, anti-slavery journals or newspapers reprinted in them. And Stephen Foster would have seen that at Charles Shiraz's that he even wrote a song like that. It, is, it shows how he was sympathetic and he had been taken in. He took in the anti-slavery movement. Morrison Foster denied that Shiraz ever had any hand in any lyrics at all. Even the most subversive and anti-slavery ones, like the fourth verse of Ring the Banjo, where the enslaved protagonist is heavily implied to kill his enslaver. Well, early in the morning of a lovely summer's day, my master sent me warning that he liked to hear me play. On the banjo I was captain and I come with dulcet and strain. My master called a napkin and he'll never wake again. Ring, ring the banjo, I like that good old song. Come again, my true love, oh, where you've been so long. I don't think Charles Shiraz wrote those words, but I think he was influenced in the anti-slavery opinions from going with Charles Shiraz. As we'll see, though, Morrison's politics gave him ample reason to obscure Stevens' views on these issues if, in fact, they disagreed. 
and I suspect they did. Resorting to finding evidence in the music alone is equally fraught, but I do want to reiterate that it's a contradiction to write, on the one hand, a song so inspired by Uncle Tom's Cabin, and on the other hand, not to be at least somewhat sympathetic to abolitionism. Foster himself coached his music in at least one stage performance in Pittsburgh, and in it he encouraged performers to sing his songs with feeling and sentimentality. Slapdash stage productions of the hit novel were transformed into quasi-minstrel shows, but this time with an explicit anti-slavery cause. Harriet Beecher Stowe hated these adaptations of her novel, just couldn't stand them, but I'm not aware of any evidence that Foster disliked them. After all, they were vehicles for his music. My Old Kentucky Home was effectively the end of Foster's string of big hits and slowly growing reputation. He abandoned the minstrel genre for the remainder of the 1850s for a number of different reasons. One, the genre just changed. As a mirror to the nation's racial turmoil, minstrelsy transformed once again. Outside of these Uncle Tom stage productions, these shows threw off any vestige of sympathy. They reindulged in the brutal stereotypes of decades gone by. Edwin Christie retired in 1854, and his replacement, an unrelated guy named George Christie, inherited the troupe, and they now sang Foster's music without any of the pathos that Foster always urged. Foster's move away may have been because he lost the ensemble that would do it justice, and no troupe was interested in Foster's sympathetic portrayals when minstrelsy was getting meaner. The minstrel stage changed. Um, after 1854, supposedly the program, they, got, they didn't do the sentimental minstrelsy, and they just started to do the very negative, insulting programs that they had done before. And that was when Stephen Foster stopped writing songs. For seven years, he didn't write any, um, any of those minstrel songs. The move away from minstrelsy allowed Foster to focus on other genres, including one grand musical spectacle called The Invisible Prince, or The War of the Amazons, with Charles Shiraz as the librettist. It was the most theatrical Foster would ever be as a mature composer. And this was in line with other such fairy spectacles, as they were called, then popular, and was put on as part of a benefit concert for the terminally ill Shiraz, who died in July 1854. Is it a coincidence that Foster's most anti-slavery music ended with Shiraz's death? I doubt we'll ever know. The Fosters' precarious finances had been eased due to their involvement in democratic politics. They were connected enough to secure appointments and clerkships in prior democratic presidential administrations. It was a foregone conclusion that the family would support the democratic nominee, whoever it was, in the hotly contested 1856 race, and antebellum polarization was fast approaching its violent tipping point. It wasn't just any nominee, though. Foster's oldest surviving sister, Anne Eliza, had married the Reverend Dr. Edward Buchanan, an Episcopal priest who served in Lancaster County and later at Trinity Church Oxford in Philadelphia. And he was the youngest brother of James Buchanan, a lock for the nomination. Buchanan had served in both houses of Congress, he'd been Secretary of State under James K. Polk, and had been an ambassador to the UK and Russia at separate times. And he'd been sent off to these diplomatic posts because prior presidents, well, they hadn't thought him good for a whole lot else. He possessed a combination of conniving and cowardice that characterized some of humanity's worst leaders. In a cruel twist of history, the overseas posts that he held turned out to be his lifeline. In an electoral climate dominated by slavery, and questions about your voting record on slavery, Buchanan was the only candidate on the Democratic side who didn't have a voting record, on the contentious Kansas-Nebraska Act particularly. This 1854 Act said uh, slavery can be voted in in any territory, that any of the new territories, if they want north or south, anywhere, they can vote in and have slavery. There was bleeding Kansas, there was blood, there was John Brown murdering people. His election was facilitated by a shift in American party politics the dissolution of the Whig Party, and the emergence of the anti-slavery Republican Party and the anti-Catholic Know-Nothing Party as candidates for its replacement. The Know-Nothings put forth the former president Millard Fillmore as their candidate, 
and Republican John C. Fremont made a respectable showing in New England and a swath of the northernmost states, but he was not going to be the first Republican to occupy the White House. Foster's high level of production at the beginning of the 1850s had trickled to a halt by its middle. He moved away from the minstrel idiom and deaths haunted his family, most notably his father. By 1856, he took a pause on the popular songwriting to write a couple of campaign songs. In August, only a few months until Election Day, Stephen and Morrison Foster founded the Allegheny Buchanan Glee Club, which marched through the streets with their bodyguards and got into fights with Republican Glee Clubs. And they say divisiveness in politics is a recent phenomenon. The rise of an explicitly anti-slavery party, with a good shot of the presidency, spurred Foster to write The White House Chair, a milquetoast pro-Buchanan anthem, and the wildly hateful The Great Baby Show, where he attacked the Republicans in part by comparing them to a minstrel show. Buchanan was not the only presidential candidate that year to benefit from a Foster-penned campaign tune. Both the Fremont and Fillmore campaigns used the melodies of songs like Camptown Races and My Old Kentucky Home to support their candidates. Foster's politics mirrored those of Buchanan's and of his blood relatives. They were all dyed-in-the-wool, antebellum Democrats who sought preservation of the status quo longer than was possible. In this case, preserving the Union through sticking their fingers in their ears, closing their eyes, and going... <laughs> These folks weren't necessarily pro-slavery, but they're willing to tolerate it and ignore it in perpetuity rather than figuring out a moral and political stance on the issue. A distinction, to my mind, without a difference. To support his family's financial well-being, Foster threw his lot behind anti-abolitionism when push came to shove and blows came to bloodshed in the Midwest. The family needed a Democrat in the White House to survive. The problem with Stephen Foster is he was very confused and vacillating, and he couldn't, and he was very insecure. Foster may well have had some sympathy for the enslaved, but he wasn't willing to endorse the tactics of men like John Brown. Buchanan won Pennsylvania, and would go on to win the presidency, and become one of the country's worst to ever hold the office. But he lost Pittsburgh. <laughs> White Americans of this time judged music with a European yardstick, or meter stick, I guess, and there was a great hunger for the trappings and aesthetics of high culture. Foster was not immune to the draw of what they called white men's music. The high point of this European emulation was Come Where My Love Lies Dreaming, one of a number of one-off or otherwise unusual projects for a songwriter who seemed to have missed his big break at fame. From where my love lies dreaming, dreaming the happy hours away, in visions bright, redeeming the fleeting joys of day, dreaming the happy hours He'd done a huge arranging project for Firth and Pond called the Social Orchestra, but he only ever got a flat rate for it and he put a ton of work into it. He gets $150 flat. They didn't give him any more royalties on it. He briefly returned to minstrelsy in 1860's Old Black Joe, but it's barely an example of the genre. Gone is the dialectical spelling. The only trace is what Foster tells us of his protagonist. It's not about returning to a specific prior time as much as it is an idealized, romanticized, carefree youth. Largely, Foster withdrew from the parlor music scene, or what was becoming of it. It was a return to the familiar, at the same time, almost too great a risk. He could get better copyright protection and assure he could be credited for all of his music, but he'd have to market himself without the aid of a big-name touring ensemble. As the Civil War loomed, Americans were less interested in the music of yesteryear. He would have to make his living through sales of sheet music alone. Nobody had ever done that before. Performance always paid better. Mozart had worked himself to death trying to be the first freelance classical composer. A similar fate lay in Foster's future. 
His exclusive rights with Firth and Pond expired, and with it came the ability to shop around New York City. Desperate, and not having developed any negotiation skills at all, Foster signed several contracts based on flat fees, not royalties. He was willing to write whatever his publishers wanted him to write. His publishers, though, didn't know what the public wanted, because none of the antebellum styles seemed to cut it anymore. Firth and Pond were not willing to bring out anything but old, tried-and-true Foster. At this point, that meant songs about children who were either dead or were about to die. Sentimental songs about mothers and or soldiers would dominate the wartime market, and Foster dutifully churned out one after another after another. When the Civil War broke out, many Americans were naive enough to think the war would be over in a matter of a few short battles. As the months turned into years, and at least to northern civilians, the Confederacy seemed capable of upsetting the Union in a second American Revolution, what northerners wanted of their music changed. Stephen Foster's late work focused on songs that supported the Union cause. Foster was at his most political in his 1862 song That's What's the Matter, which shows how Stephen set aside party loyalty in favor of preserving the Union, highlighting the split between Democrats who supported the war, known as War Democrats, and those known as Copperheads, who opposed Lincoln's policies and pushed for appeasement. In the song, he renounces political partisanship. It kind of shows where he stood because when Lincoln came in, he was devoted to Lincoln. Other songs romanticized Lincoln's call for 300,000 volunteers, or provided the sisters of soldiers an outlet to express their worry or grief. Foster's politics resulted in war songs that were decidedly pro-Union, but ignored the war's causes. His heart wasn't in it to write the songs that America wanted and needed. His simple approach to poetry could not match the eloquence of that era's enduring lyrics. The only song from 1862 to have survived the decades was the apolitical Beautiful Dreamer. Even that one was published posthumously, and was one of many marketed as his final work. Throughout the war, and especially prior to the Emancipation Proclamation, federal soldiers didn't associate their cause with that of ending slavery, just preserving the Union. As Stephen embraced the cause, Morrison, now living in Cleveland, grew more conservative. Because Copperheads dominated in Ohio, cities like Cleveland lived or died by their ability to do commerce with the South. The war radicalized Morrison and his wife Jessie, whose circle of fierce copperheads flirted with treachery and sedition. Henrietta Foster, too, hung out in Morrison's circles, which included Congressman Clement Vallandigham, who would be court-martialed for his pro-Southern views and exiled in 1863. Henrietta went so far as to pin copperhead poetry while her husband was a captain in the Army of the Potomac fighting for the Union. After Vallandigham and exile lost his gubernatorial campaign, Morrison committed himself to a conspiracy theory about voter fraud. The more things change. In March 1857, Foster had sold all of his remaining copyrights to Firth and Pond for $1,872.28. New songs were not coming to him. His only song in 1857 wasn't even new, it was a revision of something that had been in his sketchbook for a while. His contract was lucrative. He could make up to 1200 bucks a year if he could write a song every month. And by the start of the Civil War, he'd raise his production to that song a month mark. Problem is, he was overdrawn to the tune of about $1,400. His return to minstrelsy was not selling like it once was. The shows had closed. The theaters all closed. And the publishers used to like to buy music that was performed on the stage then they knew they could sell it. But there wasn't even, when he first moved there, it, just, it was just a very, very bad time to be in the songwriting business. His only option was to write for his life. Of the almost 200 songs that Foster wrote in his life, he wrote about 49 of them in 
the last couple of years. 1863 was even more prolific. He holed himself up at the corner of Christie and Hester Streets in Manhattan. It's not part of Chinatown, as you can see, but this used to be what was called a liquor grocery, where they had a grocery store in the front and a liquor store in the back, and these institutions dotted the city. Foster would go to the front to get a turnip, eat a turnip as his lunch, and drink himself to death in the back while he was trying to churn out songs to keep up with the highly inflationary wartime economy. Friends and family shipped him clothes for the frigid New York winters, but he inevitably sold them for drinking money. Almost half of the songs that Foster wrote in 1863 set the poetry of George Cooper, who was getting bored of studying law under future president Chester Arthur. Foster usually wrote his own words, but he wasn't against setting those of others if he felt like they fit. And George Cooper, over a decade his junior, was his only confirmed long-term creative partner. In less than a year, the duo produced almost two dozen songs. The old songs that Foster wrote himself with his own words were always pining for the past, long ago, the regret, regret, regret. And nobody wanted that. They really didn't want it anymore. Stephen Foster recognized that he couldn't, he couldn't really write those other type of songs. George Cooper moved him in another direction towards wordplay and patter, towards what we think of as British music hall music and vaudeville. There was a song that Stephen wrote in New York called If You Only Had a Mustache. Oh, all of you poor single men, don't ever give up in despair, for there's always a chance where there's life to capture the hearts of the fair. No matter what may be your age, you always may cut a fine dash. You will suit all the girls to a hair if you've only got a mustache, a mustache, a mustache, if you've only got a mustache. And yet critics regarded him as a washed up producer of pot boilers. Most of the stuff that he wrote was just uh, desperate stuff. He was scraping the bottom of the barrel there and, and drinking from it as well. Cooper had a lens into Foster's dark side. He said his musical friend drank constantly, though he never appeared to be drunk. He wrote music for the temperance cause, but was either unwilling or likely unable to kick the habit himself. He was, like so many in New York City and around the country, mired in a vicious cycle of sadness and alcoholism. He represented all of America, yet in the end in his life there was no place for him. He was still always roaming. Stephen Foster barely made it to 1864. A nasty burn at the hands of a boiler in the back of the liquor grocery, followed by him hitting his head against the wash basin of his New York hotel room, led to his hospitalization and eventual death four days later. Some accounts vary as to the nature of this final injury and the timeline of events, leading some to speculate that he didn't just happen to fall over and hit his head, but that he actually slit his own throat. When he was laid to rest here in Allegheny Cemetery, a brass band intoned, Old Folks at Home and Come Where My Love Lies Dreaming. Morrison Foster, surviving sibling, inherited all of Stephen's correspondence, and was essentially the executor of his estate. And Morrison destroyed a lot of the surviving correspondence, likely to hide evidence of the alcoholism that had led to his brother's death. The result is that what we know of Foster is really coloring within the lines that Morrison left for us. If you are born on this continent, or if you grow up on this continent, you have an internal soundscape. The melodies of Foster songs are part of that soundscape. Stephen Foster was a victim of his drinking habit, and equally a victim of circumstance. If he had been born a little bit later, or if he lived to see through the end of the Civil War and the post-war prosperity of Reconstruction, he would have lived into the early Gilded Age in a time when songwriters would have been able to make more money off of doing what they loved. Foster just didn't live during a time when that was even remotely possible. He gave it his best shot, but between a lot of decisions that he made, he wasn't able to make that happen. You can't go by the surface of things. You have to go a little bit deeper. But when you go a little deeper, the life of Foster is he's more and more sympathetic character. Frederick Douglass didn't like the blackface bit, but knew that Foster's sentimental songs were sung by black Americans, enslaved 
and free. W.E.B. Du Bois, in his critiques of white America, exempted songs like Old Folks at Home and Old Black Joe as songs that, to his ears, incorporated elements of genuine black music, instead of just making fun of it. Foster's minstrel music, when it was written, was more sympathetic relative to the rest of the genre, which is what these thinkers knew and understood. Foster's intentions matter less than what we have done with his work. How it is ingrained into the sound of America, both at home and abroad. I was talking to a group of kids at a Brooklyn high school that was incredibly uh, diverse. I mean, there was everybody, people from every country from Albania to Zambia <laughs> in that class. So I said, has anybody ever, who's ever heard of Stephen Foster? No song, no, no hands went up. And then I said, how many people have heard the song? And I recognized the melody. And then I sang a, a couple of, of uh, bars of Way Down Upon the Swanee River. Hands go up. Camp Town races sing the song, do the hands go up. A genie with a light brown hair, hands go up. I said, well, you've all heard, you haven't heard of Stephen Foster, but you've heard him. So I did an experiment and I pulled up nine or 10 different Stephen Foster songs. And I said, okay, for, folks, just to start this, put your hand up if you've heard it and put your other hand up if you know what it is. Probably 70% of the students for probably eight of the 10 songs put up the one hand the one hand that said, I recognize this, I've heard this, but left down the hand and conveyed, but I don't know what it is. It may be fashionable in our modern era to say that silence is a tacit endorsement. By that yardstick, it's a damning indictment of Stephen Foster that he didn't leave us with any direct evidence of his attitudes towards slavery. By far the biggest issue of his time. But what could have done for Foster to have made a vigorous statement when the vast majority of people who sang his music never even knew his name? Would it not have been best for him to encode his views in song? To make use of his enormous but quasi-anonymous platform? These are questions without firm answers. Moreover, they're questions that artists have always faced. Is it better to just be an out-and-out -out activist? To tell your audiences this is what your music is about, to wear your heart on your sleeve, or is it better to let your music speak for itself? Foster's work is so woven within the fabric of American society that we cannot answer these questions about Foster without asking those same questions of ourselves. He was one of the first persons who created music that had verse-verse uh, chorus, verse-verse chorus. The, the whole, the, the song structure the, of, 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 until at least rap, most American popular song. In Pittsburgh, between the University of Pittsburgh and the Carnegie Library, there used to stand a statue of Stephen Foster. It was, for obvious reasons, taken down a few years ago. It depicted a paternalistic Foster hovering above an old barefoot black man playing a banjo. Years of outcry preceded its removal. The question of what we do with it is more potent than ever. It is a metaphor. It's a stand-in for Foster's legacy. Sure, we shouldn't have monuments that look like that in public life, no doubt about it. But there's a fine line between acknowledging that society has changed for the better and whitewashing the past. To remove a statue of Foster without a meaningful replacement that acknowledges the complexity of the man and his legacy, there's not even a plaque there stating what was once there. Well, that's similar in my mind to the phenomenon of singers who are more than happy to revive the parlor music, but won't touch anything else. You have to take the good with the bad. It's very difficult when you do scholarship, or for that matter, if you do popular presentation like podcasting and broadcasting, on topics which contain troubling perspectives, like racism or anti-Semitism or misogyny, to say, look, I study it to seek to understand it and to convey an understanding of it and to make it make sense in the context of its time. That I study it is not a defense of the topic or of the attitudes. We can't remove Foster from the story of America and changing American identities. To get a true picture of both Foster and his times, that which makes us uncomfortable cannot be airbrushed away. So many people here and abroad already think that some of his most well-known songs are just simply American folk tunes. Can we honor the good things about Foster's legacy while still acknowledging the racism of the time and the systems that enabled him to become so famous? 
I don't have an answer to that question. It's an ongoing conversation, but until then, this small and assuming empty plaza in the Steel City will be a stark reminder of that very challenge. Susanna, oh Susanna, oh don't you cry for me. I come from Alabama, we but I jump on my knees. Susanna, oh Susanna, Susanna, don't you cry for me. Susanna, I come from Alabama, we but I jump. We but I jump, Susanna.